There is no official start time, so let's just say it. The road to the Queen's Plate starts today. Against all odds, the country's three-year-olds will contest against each other, with each week bringing us closer to the Holy Grail. Here is the finish in the Coronation Futurity, and what a finish it was! Already, Coronation Futurity Champion Decision Day has come back to run in the $400,000 Holy Bull. He lost by 33 and a quarter lengths at Gulfstream Park, but something tells us that he'll bounce back when he comes back to Woodbine. And Kingsport broke on top for the early lead. Then there's Kingsport, whose first try around two turns brought him to the stakes winner's circle in the King Garvey Stakes. Kingsport rambles home to win the King Garvey. Grand Billy is one that ran them off their feet to win at first asking at Gulfstream Park. He went five and a half furlongs, beating a $1.2 million purchase in Tennessee. Well, this is what jockeys and trainers and you know owners as well look for is these kinds of horses. And that's uh, that's one of the biggest challenges is you're going against the best and and people don't they they don't hold back when they go into these big. It's massive. It's what everybody aims for here. The crowd, you know, the knowing that you're being part of this one huge race, you know, that everybody aims for, it's, it just feels amazing. Who will win the 2015 Queen's Plate? Is it possible that it's a three-year-old we haven't seen yet? Nonetheless, when those gates open for the 156th time, every jockey, trainer, and owner will be on equal playing field to achieve their Queen's Plate dreams. Only time will tell what road our future Queen's Plate star will take. And on July 5th, he or she will be crowned a Queen's Plate champion. Shimu wins the 155th running of the Queen's Plate. With 70 yards to go and coming down the wire, Canada's great little horse, Northern Dancer, wins handily by seven. Father's performance, Dan Smartly, an overwhelming winner of the Queen's Plate. And Mike Fox on the outside! Mike Fox got it! And Emma Jane Wilson becomes the first female jockey to win the Queen's Plate. And here comes Lexi Lowe. Simu wins the 155th running of the Queen's Plate. Hamid's Holiday was second, and asserting that was third. The Queen's Plate is still months away and you can feel the anticipation starting to build. Welcome to the premiere of Road to the Plate. My name is Santino DePaola and I'm joined by my co-host, Handel VRL, who will be giving us his expert picks and advice leading up to July 5th, that being Queen's Plate Day. So what are we looking for going forward to July 5th? Well, Santino, we're looking to find that horse that will be able to run 10 furlongs on that first Sunday in July. We're still in February, so we've got a lot of work to do to uncover that horse. However, we have been looking far and wide to find that horse as far away as Florida, California, New York, and even right here at home in Ontario. So what path do you take going towards the Queen's Plate? Do you go to Florida and start training in Florida, get ready in the nice sunshine, or do you stay in Canada and handle the brutal winter we've been having? Yeah, this has been a monumental winter. We've had snow, we've had ice, we've had everything. So if you've had a chance to get away to Florida, you're taking an edge right now. You've had a chance to turn your horse out, let him be a horse, just enjoy himself, and then come back on that training regime and route to planning a plate run. Now, do you start a horse in Florida when you're training in Florida? Do you start him or do you come back to Woodbine and that would be his first start? A lot of great trainers tell me they always listen to their horse. So if the horse says, let's run in Florida, they'll probably run in Florida. Ideally. I like seeing a horse that's on a path that leads directly to the Queen's Plate as opposed to horses that we see right now that are already competing because they're on a derby run. And the issue with a derby run is you could fall off that derby trail and then default into a Queen's Plate run and you hope you've got enough horse left by then. So when you're running in Florida, you're running on dirt or turf. But when you're running on Woodbine in Canada, it's poly track. Do you think that, that varies for what people might do? It certainly does. Some horses may be versatile enough to run on any surface or both surfaces. You might look at the sire to get a, a lead as to whether or not he's a synthetic sire. 
as one of the clues for deciding if your horse could do both. Uh, I think again, it's just about deciding what is your plan. If I'm planning for the Queen's Plate, do I need to get a race in in Florida because the horse is just peaking at that time? Or do I need to wait till I get back here and maybe make a start in the Woodstock or the Queenston? So prep races, let's talk about prep races in terms of the Woodstock and the Queenston and the plate trial. Going forward, do you think you should start going six, seven furlongs in the Woodstock and Queenston or do you think you come back from Florida, you go a mile and 16th and you start going long? Well, we'll just stay with the facts. And the facts say that generally a sprinter wins the Woodstock, not really a horse en route to the Queen's Plate. I say that and there's a big asterisk before we get a whole bunch of uh, Twitter messages. Wando won this race and won the Triple Crown. But this is not the norm. This is usually a race won by sprinters. You might see you get to the Queenstown when you stretch out a bit and in the Marine as being true indicators of what the contenders are. Uh, in Canada, you know, we, we tend to have a much shorter uh, lead up to a Queen's Plate that they do leading up to the Kentucky Derby. You know, they're prepping for the Derby in November, it seems like sometimes, uh, all the way up to, to the year because of the, the great weather, of course. Whereas for us up in Canada, we interrupted by winter and we won't get started again until April. Santino, let's take a look at Dan Smartly and her great run to the Queen's Plate. Speaking again about having a plan for this horse, Jimmy Day did an incredible job pointing this horse to the Queen's Plate. Let's have a look at the video. And they're off. Light, light breaks alertly on the outside. Coming up from in between horses now, there goes a dance smartly and dance smartly, dance smartly in wilderness song. The Canadian fillies are one, two, sweet Sarita. Star taking command. Dance smartly is trying to stay with her, but Meadow Star too much. Dance smartly, the 1991 Canadian Triple Crown winner, started her road to the Queen's Plate by winning the Star Shoot Stakes as the one to nine choice. Later on, went on to win the Celine followed by an effortless win in the Canadian Oaks. Then she faced the boys in the Queen's Plate and was an overwhelming winner. She wrapped up her season winning the Breeders' Cup Distaff and went a perfect 8 for 8 in her 3-year-old season and was Horse of the Year in Canada. Inside, and the Queen of Canadian Racing is going to wear the crown, the Triple Crown, the Bank of Montreal Triple Crown. Dance smartly, majestic in victory. It's Coast for place between Shiny Key and January Man. Dan Smartly being the perfect example of a horse going to Florida, training in Florida, and coming back to Woodbine to run in prep races like the Celine and the Canadian Oaks, almost like Lexi Liu did back in 2014, taking the Oaks and Queen's Plate double. We asked our audience here at Road to the Plate what prep races they thought were the most important going towards the Queen's Plate. And without a doubt, they said the plate trial stakes followed by the Woodstock and then the Marine. Do you agree? Yeah, this is logical. Again, with the, with the shorter season in the Canadian landscape, the plate trial is really when you form your true opinions of who can get the distance and who's a now horse. Uh, and with the plate trial being now in the same weekend as the Oaks, it really levels the playing field for the Phillies and the boys bouncing back into the Queen's Plate on similar rests. Instead of being two weeks out the plate trial and then the Oaks being three weeks out, you get to run same day and see compare times. Absolutely, and we've been doing that every year ever since. Yep. It's time for our first break here on Road to the Plate, and when we come back, we're gonna look at our division leader being a Mies Flatter. We're also gonna take a look at Decision Stay's run in the $400,000 Holy Bull. Javier Castellano in the Mucho Macho Man. Welcome back to Road to the Plate. We're going to take a look at Amiz Flatter, our division leaders. Last two races being the Mucho Macho Man Stakes and the Sam Davis at Tampa Bay. All in line. They're racing in the Mucho Macho Man. 
Off to a good start. Mathuk on the far outside came out well. Longs to go. Mathuk second to the outside. Juan and Bina's third. Then it's Amy Flatter. Brother Bobo's got five lengths to make up. Honest is next, and they're coming to the top of the stretch. Has the lead coming down to the wire. Bluegrass singer and Javier Castellano in the Mucho Macho Man. And running to a perfect start in the 35th running of the Sam Davis and Catalina Red wins the break. There goes Divining Linda Ride fifth. Bears personality is on the outside sixth. Crittenden is now real as Divining Rod and Ocean Knight on the outside. Ocean Knight on the outside. Divining Rod heads apart. Ocean Knight gets the nod and remains undefeated. <laughs> They're off in the Lamb Home South Holy Bull. And it's frosted with early speed. Bluegrass Singer control early, throwing his head up and down on that first turn. Decision Day goes up on the outside, and then it's Keen Ice, followed by Fremento, and high side of Bluegrass Singer, and turns for home in front in the Holy Bull. It is up start in front, leaving Bluegrass Singer behind, and then it's frosted to the... So, Handel, what did you think about his last two races? The second place effort in the Mucho Macho Man and the fourth in the Sam Davis. The first effort was obviously impressive. First time out this season. Really quick, quick running time. Right. Quick running time, big buyer number, and they come back into the Sam F. Davis, which the horse, the tamper surface is funny, and the horse seemed to struggle just going into that 3 8 pole. Yeah. And then suddenly in the stretch, is running back on again. Yeah, he was starting to pick it up. Even Absolutely. galloping out, he was running them down, which is a good sign to go a mile and a quarter on July 5th. Right, and I'm thinking that they probably could be continuing on a derby run here with this horse, because that was certainly a good enough performance to try again. Would you go back to Gulfstream, or would you stay at Tampa? Uh, again, the Tampa surface, maybe second time out, you run better on it. I would prefer to see them go back to Gulfstream, but you will face the big boys if you go back to Gulfstream, that's for sure. Okay, the next horse we're going to take a look at is Coronation Futurity winner Decision Day and his somewhat poor effort in the Holy Bull. What did, what did you think about the Holy Bull stakes? Well, the horse had some trouble. If you take a good look at the head-on replay for that race, going into the first turn, the horse is being interfered by another horse that's rank and the rider is unable to control it. Uh, Velasquez makes a decision to, to go up and go by that horse, whereas I think he was planning to sit back, or it appeared he was planning to sit back with the horse. Uh, the horse is done with probably a half mile left to go, and he does the right thing. He saves the horse for another day. Uh, he's come back to work a half mile, haven't seen a second work since, so we'll have to keep an eye on what happens next with this horse. Do you think it's difficult to go to Gulfstream Park with having no works over the track? It's that kind of surface? I've heard people say this. Uh, I've heard lots of experts say this, you know, where you fear Palm Meadows or wherever it might be when you ship over, you ship over to run a race. There's a horse on our Queen's Plate list missed from the Dale Romans barn, and he did that just last week. He shipped that horse from Palm Meadows up to Gulfstream to work because they're going to be running next week. So maybe there is something to that when you see other trainers are doing it as well. Or maybe he just really likes the Woodbine Poly track. Could well be. Hopefully he's a horse that can do both because they're looking to, to have some more races from him down in Florida. Last year, it was Lexi Liu who won the Queen's Plate for trainer Mark Cassie and owner Gary Barber. Someone who was more behind the scenes of Lexi's road to the plate was her breeder, Sherry McLean. We're going to show you feature one of three of Sherry McLean, The Dream. holiday and Lexi Lou has taken the lead. They are in the last 16th of a mile. The Philly was fabulous this afternoon. Lexi Lou wins the 150th running of the Queen's Plate. My saying was she looks like a racehorse. She will be a racehorse. She is a racehorse. Like they don't just look like that. Oh man. 
Uh, that whole day is kind of, some of it's a blur. I was really excited and I talked to a lot of um, the different people around you talking to. And I'm asking everybody, you, you know, you're talking about who you're all going for. And, and you were near where we were, but I remember telling people, watch for this horse. I think there were some girls that wound up taking our table because we were at another table and telling them to to follow Lexi Lou into the race, right? Because we had bred her. And I was pretty excited. I did think she would be in the top three. I didn't know how good she was, but I thought she'd be there. When she was coming down that straight, well, there's probably nobody screaming louder than me. And after the race was over, it was all, I just kept saying, she did it, she did it, she did it. Like, it's unfathomable because it was one of the, the dreams that, uh, it was one of the things that Mike had in his head that not only did we want to raise horses that could run Queen's Plate level, which our first horse that did that on our own breeding program was Pender for us, um, to turn around and have um, her win the Queen's Plate and it be a filly um, was phenomenal. Like, it, it, it's hard to express just how strong the feelings were. I, I mean, I, I called my the people with my connections that were close to Mike. Um, I spoke to to Moira. I spoke to to his son Duncan that night. I mean, I think we we're just crying because it's just like, you know, it's special. It's different. It's special. It's special for all kinds of reasons. But it was like. I think Mike just picked her up and carried her across the line. <laughs> that was how great that was to have a horse, um, you know, that that Mike had bred and, you know, to win, to win that plate. So, pretty phenomenal. Uh, yes, under Gardner Farms and with Dr. Coulter John, yes, we did. Um, very, very proud of that moment. Um, we had been nominated prior to that. I, I wish we'd won it when Mike was alive. We were nominated the one year. And uh, if you were based on numbers, percentages, um, we did very well compared to the other big farms. We didn't have a lot of mares. Uh, a lot of people think we had a massive mare herd and we didn't. Um, but we had a massive work, but our mare herd was a very much a working mare herd, like horses that produce. And um, a lot of that too stemmed from a lot of hard work making sure that the stallions we were using and brought in to Ontario were stallions that suited the mare market here in Ontario. And um, we wanted our horses to be able to compete. Well, when we originally had Lexi Lou's mom, she was a decent racehorse. Mike loved the NXS line. We bought the mare um, again for breeding. Slago Bay was one of the was the cross that he felt would work with the NXS line, um, and of course it did produce Lexi Lou. Um, I have acquired and and post that other bef Lexi Lou was sold, and so was the mare at the time after uh, Dr. Coulter John passed. She, at the time, hadn't produced anything. Uh, the main horse has since been Lexi Lou. She was sold in full to Spaniard, and um, she basically wound up going out to Quebec to act as a broodmare, and because of her size, like she's 16'3", uh, and be a riding or show horse as well. Um, so basically she went out to a uh, different life. Um, when Lexi Lou was running as a two-year-old, I started kind of trying to figure out where she, the mare was um, with no idea like what was going to happen going forward and trying to find out the foal out of the mare wound up being registered, the uh, Spaniard foal. And I wound up having contact with the young lady that had purchased the foal from from the mayor's owner. I was able to purchase um, Lexi Lou's half-sister out of Spaniard from the young lady in Quebec as well. 
I've brought her home and she is now under tack and training in Florida at Classic Mile and we're really looking forward to her um, hopefully as an early two-year-old uh, but she's she's a she is a nice typey horse for racing so we'll see what happens and uh, looking forward looking forward to that as a future and looking forward to I'm breeding one excess back or one excess of night back to um, Sligo Bay of course I mean I got a now because right now that's that's going to be the hot commodity and uh, um, but very excited about it all Welcome back to Road to the Plate. It is now time for our top 10, and we're going to take a look at a couple runners from the Cassie Stable. One is based out in Arkansas, and one from California. Thank you, Santino. Now, let's take a look at the top 10 list, keeping in mind it's week one, and it will feature a lot of horses who have been currently running down south. At number 10, we've got London Tower. At 9, Kingsport. Both horses have not yet started. At eight, Conquest Typhoon. We'll take a look at his race uh, from just last weekend. Seven, she's a masterpiece who finished third behind Nippagon and Decision Day. At six, Mist from the Dale Romans Barn. This horse just shipped into Gulfstream, so they're coming close to a race now. In our top five, we've got Nippagon at number five and just began a training schedule with a couple of uh, three-eighths works. Decision Day is at four, who we featured earlier on in our program. At number three, the buzz horse, Danzig Moon, who is likely on a derby run for the Cassie Stable. At two, Conquest Culinate, impressive maiden winner at Oakland, and a horse with a beautiful stride and one I look forward to seeing a lot more of. And the number one spot is still a Mies Flatter coming off that fourth place in the Sam F. Davis. Now let's take a look at our featured horses from the Cassie Barn. First, Conquest Culinate and that maiden score at Oakland. Quest Typhoon, Samuel D. Champagne, Ethical Funds on the far outside, last 16th of a mile. Conquest Typhoon blew them away to win the summer stakes. Samuel D. Stormy Liberal gets the lead. Conquest Typhoon hooks to the outside and comes with his run now. Papa Cool, Papa Cool as well. Conquest Typhoon, superbly timed by Mike Smith, up to win it. Conquest side of stand and salute and mischief Clem and out deeper still soul driver being sent forward five wide uh, just in behind those horses is matter boss as the field structure has compressed around the turn at the top of the lane Erna Shackleton headed by conquest typhoon soul drivers coming home fast so is matter boss down the outside with harmonic it's matter boss moving up and taking the lead from conquest typhoon they're clear of harmonic and soul driver and on the inside cross the line but matter Boss, a towering performance. This is a real progressive cult. Metaboss raced away to win by two and a half lengths. Crossed the line on the inside, I think, grabbed second from either Harmonic or Conquest Typhoon. What did you think about our two featured horses this week? Well, we've got two horses, uh, very different styles. You know, you've got the, the curling horse that's going to be all about the stamina and all about how far they run and getting better as they get longer. It seems like the longer the better for them. Yeah, him. beautiful stride. Galloped up really nicely in that race. And this horse has actually entered on February 19th, the day before we go to air. So it's going to be interesting to see how it comes out of that allowance race. Whereas a Conquest Typhoon, you've got the opposite happening. 
you've got a horse where you've got questions raised now about distance limitations. Is a mile and a quarter going to be too far for this horse? Do you think Cassie wanted to run him on the synthetic in this prep race? I think so. I think they wanted to find out if he could go a lot further. And I think they probably wanted to give him a spot that was suitable uh, for his skills. And, and this looked like a good race for him. He ended up on the lead, something that probably was not a part of the plan. But he definitely got tired late. So it definitely comes into question. Stormy Atlantic going a mile and a quarter shouldn't translate. But we'll have to see what comes next for this horse. Does he go back to the grass? Do they shorten up? Even the third leg of the Triple Crown and the Breeder Stakes. It's a mile and, and a half. A mile though. and a half. But it's quite far. he is the grade two summer stakes winner from last year. Yeah, I think, uh, I think this horse might be a horse we see come off the distance running trail and, and perhaps become more of a horse you see running uh, on the grass or running at shorter distances. Do you think going a mile and eighth in this race already in February, I mean, we're a long ways away from Queen's Plate, do you think going a mile and eighth, maybe he'll grow into himself and mature enough to get a mile and a quarter? So uh, I'm going to say that if this was not a Conquest Stables horse in the Marcassi barn, that I'd probably be answering yes to those questions. But when you've got many runners to choose from, you may just simply steer this horse in a different direction because you've got the curling horse that wants to go that far with the same ownership group. So do what's right by the horse and maybe stick going a mile on the turf and... Win a bunch of races with boat horses. Seems like a logical plan. When we come back, we're gonna see who to look out for on the road to the plate and we're gonna catch up on the Eclipse Award winning jockey who's trying to win his first Queen's Plate. Omar Moreno, a two-time Sovereign Award-winning jockey, he also won the Eclipse Award for Top Apprentice in all of North America. Despite his achievements, he's yet to win his first Queen's Plate. We sat down with Omar to discuss how, how much it would mean to him if he won the Queen's Plate. Everybody that gave me the opportunity to be here tonight, I'm, I'm very grateful from all of my heart. My family, my mom and dad that always been there and supporting me all the way through and my close friends, but most of all, every single person, you know, that gave me a chance. If it wasn't for you guys, I would not be here tonight. So thank you very much. Omar Moreno had no thoughts about being a jockey when he was growing up. He had his sights planned on being a police officer, a carpenter, or an architect. Moreno would soon find a love for boxing after an incredible boxing career which won him three Canadian national championships he decided to give horse racing a try. My brothers and I we were all split up in uh, foster homes and uh, we were only allowed to see each other for like once a week in, the, on a, in a certain place so just to see each other a little bit more often I decided to go boxing where they used to box you know and that way we got to hang out and and do something and learn something and from there I just end up enjoying boxing and you know I started it off I didn't want to do anything else just to be competitive and I think the whole competition of it is what kept me going in there a friend of mine said to me one day that you should be a jockey I had no idea what a jockey was when I was about 18 years old he took me to the racetrack just to show me a race and I thought it would look you know a lot of fun it looked very easy on top of it, so I thought I'd give it a try. And when I was 21, I ended up going to school for it. I can't say full credit, but the one person that did get me into the sport is uh, Dennis Sejak. And he, you know, he held my hand by, uh, through the whole way, kind of thing, right? And, um, and later on, he introduced me to more people that ended up helping me out more. When asked what his goal was for 2015, Moreno said to be top rider, and of course, to win the Queen's Plate. My main goal is to be one of the top riders in Canada and to one day win the Queen's Plate. It, to me, it would mean being part of history in the horse racing industry. It was amazing. Um, the crowd, you know, the, knowing that you're being part of this one huge race, you know, that everybody aims for, it's, it just feels amazing. Moreno won the Sovereign Award in 2009 and 2010, but he also took the Eclipse Award for the Best Apprentice in all of North America in 2010. Omar takes us through that crazy ride of winning an Eclipse Award. The year was, uh, it was very long, you know, it was, it was stressful and fun at the same time. 
and uh, but yeah, by the time it was done with, you know, it really it hits you very hard. I actually never knew I was nominated to for the Eclipse until a week or so, you know, before the, the big thing, the, the big event, and um, I'm sorry, it, before the meet was done actually, and they asked me what I thought of it, and I had no idea, and um, it was nerve-wracking really. I almost wished I didn't win it just so I didn't have to go up in front of all those people. <laughs> like anything else really, um, you know, you're out there. I know when you're watching outside of it, just watching a race, it looks like everything is going by, but when you're next to that person, it just feels like you're standing just next to them, you know? like. Um, I mean, it's very competitive when we're here, everything, you know, we joke around, you know, and everything, we're friends, but when we're out there, we're there to win. Omar's favorite moment came back in 2008 when he got his first win as a jockey. You know, actually, my favorite moment of riding was my first race ever, because um, to me, I felt like it took me a long time, you know, to get there, and then to win my first race, it felt like I accomplished something that I aimed for. So that, would have, that was my favorite moment. Moreno went to old college in Alberta to learn to become a professional jockey. It, it taught me the um, foundation of the whole, with overall of racing, you know, like the industry and everything. And um, for somebody that I didn't know anything about horses, it helped me out a lot. You know, they, they were very patient with me, you know, and... Um, I, when there's times that I wanted to quit, I thought I would never learn to do anything really. You know, they kept pushing me and telling, you know, encouraging me to, you know, just keep trying and trying. And uh, so, yeah, they, they taught me lots of, th you know, things like that. So the foundation of the writing aspect of it is what they got me going. Could this be the year that Omar Moreno gets to take home his first Queen's Plate? and really add to his already three titles of being an outstanding jockey this year in 2015. They're all in line. They're off. On this week's Pedigree Report, we focus on a horse named Grand Billy who broke his maiden first time out at Gulfstream Park. Grand Billy was bred by Gustav Chicken Dance and is at a city zip who stands for 40,000 at Lane's End Farm. He's also out of the two time stake winner Wood Smoke. Grand Billy stalked the pace of $1.2 million purchase Tennessee, C, who was trained by Todd Pletcher. He got up late in the stretch to break his maiden at first asking. Billy was bought for 40000 at the September yearling sale. Grand Billy still trying hard. Grand Billy catching Tennessee with every stride. And Grand Billy beat Tennessee. Welcome back to Road to the Plate. It's time to take a look at who's moving forward on the Road to the Plate. And let's start with Nipigon. He's back on the work tabs, only worked three furlongs so far, but he was second in the Coronation Futurity. This seems like a plan again that I like. One where uh, Rachel and her team are targeting the Queen's Plate for this horse and getting him ready now is, seems like the perfect timing. He's had a great off season, some time to relax, and now back to the work tab, two easy 3 8 works to start building towards a debut sometime in uh, late April. Yeah, so we'll probably see him at Keeneland and then back here. Do you think we'll see him in the Woodstock, Queenston kind of races or you they'll stretch him out right away? They may look for more ground for this horse. He, he might not be much of a, a sprinter at all. So yeah, Keeneland is a possibility on your way back up from Florida type thing and then you get back uh, up to Woodbine. So Mies Flatter is also back on the work tabs? Yes, perhaps with an eye continuing on the Derby Trail is what I would think. Uh, so we'll probably see this one soon in a, a derby prep. And Conquest Curlin 8, he's running at Oaklawn. Yep, ends up to run on Thursday at Oaklawn. The Southwest probably came up a little too soon for him. We now know the Southwest has since been cancelled due to inclement weather at, at Oaklawn. So he's in an allowance race on the 19th of February, which is Thursday. And uh, he's the 8-5 to five morning line favorite, so they're expecting him to run well again. Let's talk about a filly who hasn't been training yet this year so far. She has no works on the tab, Brooklyn's Way. She won the Muskoka. She was second in the Mazarine Grade 3. And then she, she kind of got a trouble trip in the Coronation Futurity. 
She had some issues in the fraternity for sure, as far as uh, having a, a difficult trip. Uh, this is a filly that uh, I'm sure they're going to be targeting the Oaks. Uh, and as long as that goes well, then they'll probably look at moving on uh, to the place. So like a Lexi Lou kind of, or a Dance Smartly. This is probably a similar strategy. Uh, this filly, I need to see what she does again at a distance of ground to be just certain that uh, she's one that could go on to a Queen's Plate run. Does it concern you that she hasn't come back on the work tab? Not at all. Not at all. Again, you've got lots of time. You know, our season's a lot different. We're not getting started until April the 11th. Uh, there's lots of time for getting ready. And a horse like Samuel D. Champagne who was second behind Conquest Typhoon in the Grade Two Summer Stakes. Do you think they're going to try him again on Polly? He was in the Coronation, didn't fare as well as I think the connections would have hoped. But maybe going forward, a different kind of three-year-old. He wasn't terrible in the Futurity, and I think the Futurity was a good race. Uh, a lot of turf works right now. Uh, he is a horse that's expected to excel on the turf. It's probably a horse that we see a long way off again in the breed of Stakes for sure. Uh, but because of his ability to, to run long, he probably ends up being a horse in the Queen's Plate as well. Whether or not he translates his form as well, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you for watching the premiere of Road to the Plate. We'd like to thank Woodbine Entertainment Group, Sherry McLean, Emma Jane Wilson, Omar Moreno, our associate producer, Julie Wright. I'm Santino De Paula. And I'm Handel Viral. And thank you for watching. Thank you for watching.